day, chaps. Well, if you excuse me. I keep forgetting that this TV's loud. Um, the last of your Pierce Brosnan films. I was tempted to do this as one whole video, but I think we'll stick it with two so that you chaps have a bit of a breather. I say chaps, you never know somebody I watch this. Jakey, jokey. Um, the world is not enough is a cute, uh, I keep saying curious, it's an interesting film in my history anyway. If Octopus is the first Bond film I remember watching um, as whole in my memory, you know, that infamous holiday Bournemouth 1992, um, then World Is Not Enough holds a place for being the first Bond film I saw in the cinema. In my lifetime, uh, I up until then, um, Few to a Kill was made the year I was born. I would have been almost two for Living Daylights, almost four for Licence to Kill, and therefore much, much too young for it. And obviously we didn't go see um, Golden Night or Never, Never Dies for some reason. I think it was a case of the fact that we couldn't get you know, it came out when school was on, we couldn't get to the cinema or something, but either way, World is not enough. First film I saw at the New Odeon on the former cattle market in town, and I went with some of my mates, and, you know, mum gave me some money, not much, probably a couple of quid, you know, buy yourself something. Well, it was my first experience of just uh, by myself, uh, without my parents doing the buying, of how much for, uh, things were. I still remember I bought a pack of... Dry roasted peanuts, which I desperately tried eating quietly because I don't know about you, I do hate it when people are rummaging around. Now, people on their phones, which, you know, if I see that during No Time to Die, I might be tempted to throw something at somebody because it's a Bond film in the cinema. I would like to watch it without your phone. Not like the chap who thought you could talk through Gran Torino, for instance. Anyway, that's not the issue, is it? The salient memory of 1999 is that everyone groaned when Bond said the world is not enough. The groan was so loud and so persistent, they drowned out Bond muttering, well, I say muttering, yeah, he was being choked, uh, family motto. And you kind of want to stand up like Diane Chambers once did in a Cheers episode and go, People, have you not read the book on the Majesty's Secret Surface? No. No one has. If they had, they might actually appreciate that film. Now, The World Is Not Enough was Pierce Brosnan's third film. It was the last film done in the 20th century as far as Bond was concerned, directed by Michael Raptor, who was born in this town. That was brilliant. And, well, has one of the longest pre-title sequences of Bond film. Now, apparently No Time To Die is going to be longer. I forget how long it's going to be, but it might well be longer. The trouble is with a pre-title sequence in The World Is Not Enough is that you, it does go on a while, long enough that you actually forget you haven't had the titles. It's kind of like when I watched Eternal Sunshine The Spotless Mind in 2004 and the film starts and it plods along and then about 15 minutes into it the titles suddenly start appearing on screen you went, hang on a minute, we haven't had the titles. With a Bond film, the titles are the song, aren't they? So you're thinking to yourself, hang on a minute, we haven't actually had a song. So you get the bank scene with that stunt uh, some, you know, one-liners and a very grim-looking Brosnan, and then you get the office with him, and then he goes after on the boat. Now, the boat scene, I don't mind. It's, again, an excuse to see London on film. Uh, much like any film, World Is Not Enough has to play fast and loose with how uh, Bond and the cigar girl get around. I mean, for instance, after... After Tower Bridge, which you don't really see him go under, I think that would have been a good aerial shot, Tower Bridge. Even, you know, they didn't need to open the bridge, obviously, but just after he, f uh, they both disappear up uh, the Neckinger, technically. Uh, St. Xavier's Dock, which is meant to be around the area where Oliver Trist, uh, where Fagin had his hideout, in the book anyway. Jacob's Island. Ridden, tuberculosis, cholera, disease, poverty ridden area of town that was cleaned up in Dickens's lifetime. Uh, the Neckinger is a dead end. It ends at Jamaica Street which runs into Bermondsey and I've been up and down a couple times because I went up there to look at where Dickens set it and then I realised it was where the world is not enough is. Now if you look at London on a map they've now gone south into into Birmingham. I'm not going to put a map on the screen 
because it's not the fact that the editing is what it is and I think that all the videos, uh, making videos have slowed my laptop but there's no point, <laughs> you got Google, the internet's free um, and it goes south and if you look on the map Greenwich and the dome is up here so Bond's gone whereas where Bond flies through to do a shortcut the ornamental canal is over the river in Wapping and Wapping's literally the opposite side it's virtually the opposite side of the river from where Bond's disappeared into so if you know that kind of thing and also some of the chase was actually filmed in Chatton historical dockyard so there you go and Chatton is not near London um, the music's not too shabby for it, and then you've got the bloody dome. I'm pretty sure the Labour government of the time said, you know, could you put the dome in? It's, uh, you know, a new millennium. We really would like to sell it. <laughs> Nothing sells something better than having the world's most famous spy land on it and break his arm. <laughs> or his shoulder, anyway. And then you got the song. And how long is that now? 15, 20 minutes? The trouble is the film sort of, it sort of feels a bit deflated after the song. It's almost like, well, you know, it's literally knackered itself with the pre-title sequence. And so what are we going to do now? The Scotland church is filmed just up the road from here, um, Stowe, uh, where that fancy school is, which I believe they filmed on the rooftop for, of the, main, of the school for Tomorrow Never Dies for the hotel. And I think... It's the golf club in Goldfinger, but then that could be the place of uh, that could be Pinewoods HQ. I know Pinewoods HQ is in a few bombs, but anyway, um, the MI6 headquarters in Scotland. It's a nice touch. It feels like Fleming. You could uh, kind of imagine Fleming's Bond going up there to see M. M thinking he can get away from London, do some fishing. Um, the portrait of Bernard Lee on the wall is a nice one because technically he is a M, and I guess you know they wanted him. And he was a big rig in the navy, one imagines. Um, you get to see the other double O's. I assume they're double O's for the first time and only time really since Thunderball. Uh, you don't get the double O's on screen, other than double O's, uh, double O nine in Octopus and obviously Trevelyan and. Golden eye. Oh, and the other and side the two double rows in Living Daylights. But <sighs> the world is not enough presets the Craig films in the whole M's got issues or there's issues with M and Bond's got issues. He wants to get back uh, he, you know, he wants to get into the action and the film's split between two villains, more or less. You've got Renard and the lecturer. Lecturer's the real brains behind the operation. Uh, she, Sophie Marceau injects into her this kind of immaturity, this innocence, this naiveness, but also stone-cold ruthlessness. She thinks she's doing the right thing. She's willing to kill her own father. And she's... <laughs> Renard went into it, I think, as the master in the relationship and ends up, obviously, being the henchman. Uh, it, some people have said it's detracted from the film. You, you effectively are given two main villains, and you've got to decide. Electra's payoff is as good as it gets for Boston's Bond. Yeah, compared to, you know, Die Another Day really didn't offer that outside of Sal, maybe, and it wasn't a mean and full payoff with Moon, because I think much of Bond's grief was with Sal. Um, And it's a touching final scene with Desmond and Llewellyn. It was never meant to be, of course. Uh, I still remember we were walking into town with my dad. And uh, dad said, as we reached the library on the edge of the town centre, like um, uh, the actor who played Q died in a car crash this weekend or something. And um, so there's extra meaning. Almost like I think with Bernard Lee in... The Fennis scene in Moonrake, oh, right, you see M with Bond again after that, and he's in the final scene. But I'm not sure the sequence they filmed. But when M parts from Bond in Fennis, there's something poignant to it, but then that's the trouble when people die, like 
Heath Ledger, you know, The Dark Knight, suddenly it's got me ed added meaning or... Um, I think it's particularly true, though, with Richard Jordan in the film Gettysburg. Uh, he was terminally ill with a brain tumour and died about a few weeks to a month after he finished on Gettysburg. Now, I think they were still doing post-production when he died. And his performance of General Armistead is just... It's heart-rendering because I... You, he knows he's on his way out, you know he's on his way out, and yeah, whereas no one knew in 1979 that Bernard Lee was going to die soon. I mean, his health had not been well for, good for almost 10 years. I mean, Kenneth Moore was lined up to replace him in Live and Let Die if he had been unwell. Uh, that would have been interesting. And, you know, Desmond Llewellyn, no one knew that was going to happen when they finished. So there's that. Otherwise, the film plods along reasonably well. It's got a good action scene at the Caviar Factory, and Zukowski is a welcome addition to the film. He's got some fantastic lines, or at least the way Bobby Coltrane delivers them. Like, you know, he's swimming in that caviar, and Bond's pressing him for details, and Bond says something, and he goes, absolutely not. And he's like, well, fine, if you want to help. Or, my insurance company is never going to believe this, and why don't you just knock like a normal bird? I. <laughs> I, for some reason, think he doesn't actually die. I mean, I know he gets shot twice and his head goes down and doesn't move again. Uh, but he's too good a character. I think he could have come back in a Brosnan casino where um, he didn't need to knacker him, but I think he could have fit quite well into another film. I suppose technically he could come back in a future film if we booted the franchise. Although they'll probably recast him for actual Russian and it'd be a woman. Um, the song as such, I don't know what it is about the 90s Bonds, I think I've been spoiled by the older films. You know, you have the likes of Shirley Bassey, Tom Jones, you could have had Frank Sinatra, you definitely had Mount Munro, Johnny Cash tried a song, but it, Thunderball, his version of Thunderball sounds like a Western song, check it out. Uh, you got, I don't know, Duran Duran. Um, and, you know, die, nobody does it better, can't be bettered, forgive the expression. And yet, Goldeneye is, is good, okay. To my mind, it sounds like cattle rolling. And the world is not enough, I just... I don't know, it's just a modern sound, I'm not really mad on modern music, you see. And that being said, you know you know my name is Skyfall, I don't mind. Um, I'll probably repeat myself in future, but uh, Another Way to Die makes my ears... Hurt and writing on the wall makes my ears and my eyes hurt. I honestly never heard um, writing on the wall until I saw Spectre in cinema. And my eyes, I, I still remember sitting there and my eyes were hurt. I was just, my eyes were wide. <laughs> I, was, I was just like, what the hell have I just watched? Um, so that's World is Not Enough. Let me have a look. What have I missed? Oh, Christmas Jones. Yeah, to think you used to have a thing for Denise Richards back in the day. Uh, you've got Stacy and you've got Christmas. Stacy's better. Christmas Jones is alright in moderation. Um, if it was me, I would have said, bugger the convention. Once the pipeline business is out of the way, thank you, and the cafe are factory, just pack her off with Sikorsky. Get your information and piss off to the Maiden's Tower. You know. If you like Christmas Jones, fair enough. The only good thing about Christmas Jones is that she does give me my unintentional persistent chuckle. You know, um, my name's Dr. Christmas Jones. I don't want to hear any jokes, and Bond goes, but I don't know any doctor jokes. Boom. Uh, let's have a look. So that brings us to Beers Boston's unintentional swan song, Die Another Day.